Okay, our topic of the day is about native pollinators, particularly focusing on mason bees. Before we get started, the library has a conflict for our May class in the evening. So the May class will be offered only in the afternoon at 2 o'clock. There will not be an evening session for May. Okay, I'm Marla Hopkenner, Master Gardener with the Missouri Valley Master Gardeners, and today we're going to talk about bees and try to make a bee house for, for them to live in. The Yankton Library provides the facilities for our classes and also houses our seed collection. And the master gardeners of Yankton are the ones who do the presentations for these classes. So let's take a look at native bees. Native bees, there are about 40,000 species of native bees in North America. And honeybees are not native. And they are also the only ones that make honey. So the purpose of all the other bees is pollination. 90% of these native bees are solitary. That means they do not live and work together in groups like honeybees do. So sunny, the honeybees have a whole social structure with who does what. You know, the queens, the drones, the workers, they all have their jobs to do. But the solitary bees, kind of outside of mating, they do everything. And they do not uh, specialize with queens like the social bees do. There are over 400 species of native bees in South Dakota. Uh, I should have mentioned with solitary bees, they will tolerate other bees in their area. For example, mason bees live side by side oftentimes with leaf cutter bees. Leaf cutter bees are the ones where if you've ever seen perfect little circles cut out of the edges of your leaves, they seem to really like roses, but that is a bee doing that. And they take that little circle of leaf and they use it to line their nests. And so that's, that's why they're cutting them out of there. So you don't want to spray to get rid of whatever might be cutting out the circles of your leaves. Just enjoy those perfect little circles. Uh, the native bees are excellent pollinators. They pollinate about 80% of our crops. Pollination is necessary for humanity because we eat those plants and we also eat the animals that eat the plants. So uh, globally, we raise about 1,400 different kinds of plants that humans eat. And so you can see how important it is that we have pollinators to pollinate those plants so that they can continue to produce more plants and keep us all alive. What's not pollinated by bees is pollinated by moths and butterflies, birds, bats, and the wind. But 80% of our food crops are pollinated by bees, so they really are important. Without pollinators, we'd lose most of our fruits and nuts, as well as our cucurbits, which are squash, cucumbers, those types of things. And uh, we would be really hard up for food. So without the pollination of all of these bees, we would probably see mass starvation. Honeybees are actually from Europe, and they are trucked the ones that are raised here to produce the honey that we eat locally uh, are trucked to California for the winter. And they are trucked there to pollinate their almond orchards and fruit orchards. Now, the mason bees actually would do a different, a better job. But I think the reason they use the honeybees is because of the honey. They do that. Not 
necessarily just because of the pollination. So if those orchards in California were to establish big colonies of mason bees, they would probably have more effective pollination. So what do bees need? Well, of course they need food sources. And they need both nectar and pollen to survive. They, uh, you need to choose a range of flower shapes and colors and keep flowers available from early spring to frost in the fall because there's always bees around that are looking for pollen and nectar and so you don't want to raise just one kind of flower. Plant season long blooms, choose non-hybrids. They're actually better pollinators than uh, the bees like them better than they like our non-hybrid or our hybrid ones. Avoid double flowers. So some of the flowers that you can buy now, um, I'm trying to think, zinnias are one. You know, they, they have so many petals, they almost look like a carnation, but it's real hard for the bees to get in there to find the pollen in those kinds of flowers. So they like the single flowers better. Plant them in masses, so don't just plant one flower here and then 200 feet over there you plant another one, but plant groups of the same flowers so they can go from flower to flower to flower all in one area. Plant in masses and sunny areas are most attractive. Many flowers like sun and the insects like that as well. And what, so what you want is a polyculture. A monoculture means all your plants are the same. Think of a lawn. If you have this perfect lawn with nothing but grass, that's a monoculture. If you want to make a bee-friendly lawn, you maybe want some, like clover in particular, is one thing that can be mixed in with your grass in your lawn, and bees love that clover. So uh, that a polyculture means you've got many different kinds of plants in one place. You can think of companion planting. That means plant plants together that like each other, that help each other out in some way. Uh, some plants attract pests, and so can, you can use that plant that attracts pests to keep it off the ones that you really want. Um, some of those are nasturtiums and sunflowers, and they both attract aphids, so they would keep the aphids off your other plants. Some fragrances repel pests. And in your flower garden, you can plant herbs right in among your flowers. You know, they'll, they'll help your flowers and you can eat them too. So rosemary and sage repel beetles. You can plant various varieties to curb diseases. And you can look for varieties that have disease resistance. And then crop rotation prevents your soil-borne diseases that will attack your plants when you raise the same thing in the same place year after year after year. So other needs, besides pollen and nectar, bees need some other things too. They need water, and you can provide, just like you have bird baths, you can have bee baths. So this is simply the cup glued, hot glued onto the base, which is decorated, but you don't need to decorate it. And then in the tray, I have hot glued little pebbles because bees don't like to be in the water. They want to sit on the pebble and get the water that way so that they, you know. Here's another one that I made. You can look at these later if you want. But like I said, you do not have to decorate your pots. And you don't even have to use pots. You can use a shallow tray with pebbles in it that's just sitting on the ground for the bees to get water. They will drink out of a bird bath if they can sit on the edge of it 
and then the water is high enough that they can actually get to the water. They need nesting sites. Yes. I put a rack in my bird rack. A rack? A rack? A rock. Yeah, you can put rocks in there too. Right. And butterflies use that too. They need nesting sites. A lot of our solitary bees live in the ground, and so they they need dirt that's not completely covered up so that they can get there and, and dig their little tunnels into the dirt, the ground. Or vegetation, like dry stems. In your flower beds, if you have flowers that have hollow stems, leave them out there for the winter and you might have some bees that actually nest in the stems of your flowers. Um, and then they need either muddy or sandy areas and mason bees need mud. So somewhere near your mason bee house, you would want to have an area of open dirt that you keep watered so that they can use that mud and I'll, and I'll show you how they build their houses in a little bit. And this bee is not a mason bee, that's actually a ground bee, but it's just to show you that they do make tunnels in the ground. And you might see these in your flower bed or in your garden. Just avoid them. They won't bother you if you don't bother them. Okay, just like polyculture, Polypollination uh, is using multiple bees for your pollination purposes. So I've compared a honeybee and a mason bee here. First of all, they do look different. In fact, if you're not familiar with a mason bee, you might think what's buzzing around your flowers is actually a fly because they've got that iridescent blue color that some flies have, but it's probably a bee. Uh, they're just slightly smaller than a honeybee, and the main difference is that honeybees have pollen baskets. So I'm going to use my <laughs> right there on their back legs. If you've ever watched honeybees at work, you will see that their back legs are just huge with yellow. That's pollen. So they collect the pollen and they store it in their back legs to take back to their hive. But that means they're not nearly as effective as poll at pollinating because they don't have all this loose pollen on them. Well, mason bees are, they have no pollen baskets. <coughs> they have hairy but bodies and the description used is that they belly flop into a flower <laughs> and they just get covered with pollen so you can see how effective that would be if you're covered with pollen and you move on to the next flower and belly flop into that one you're going to do a lot of pollen exchange so that is why they are so effective at pollinating so uh, pollinators function best when several kinds work together because some are specialists. They only pollinate one kind of plant. And a squash bee is an example of that. If you look at your squash or your cucumbers or your melons and you see bees in there that look like honeybees, it's more than likely squash bees. And that's the only thing they pollinate. Um, Honeybees are moderately effective. We don't say they're good pollinators because of those pollen baskets. They have a large range. So I think people that set up beehives have to be at least four miles away from another colony of beehives because that's how far they can travel. Uh, and they are active for the summer months. Mason bees only go about 300 feet. So when you think about where you want to put your mason bee house, consider what it is that you want them to pollinate. I would want them to pollinate my fruit trees. And so I need to set up that mason bee house not too terribly far away from where my fruit trees are in order for them to be, uh, be able to get there. 
And they're most active in the early spring. Well, what's blooming in the early spring? Fruit trees. So they're really good for fruit trees. Okay, mason bee life cycle. In the winter time, they hibernate inside cocoons. And these are nesting chambers. So here's what the inside of your tube or your hollow stem is going to look like. The bee takes a plug of mud, they carry it into that tube and pack it in there. The next thing that goes in there is a ball of pollen and then they lay their egg. And so that's the nesting chamber. Then they put in another piece of mud. So each little cocoon, each little baby bee has its own chamber in that tube. In the early spring, they will emerge as fully formed adults. Now, the interesting, I don't know if I want to talk about this here or where. Yeah, I'll talk about it here. Okay, interesting thing about mason bees. Every female is a queen. So every female is able to lay eggs. <laughs> and um, a really unique thing about mason bees is the female is able to, she has a little pouch inside her body where she stores sperm. And she can separate the male from the female. So when she lays her eggs, the females are at the back. Those are the first ones that she lays. The males are at the exit out here of the, of the tube. So in the spring, the males emerge first. And I can't answer why. I think it's maybe because they'll be out there ready when the females emerge. They'll have already been feeding and they'll be ready to start mating. That's my thinking. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't read that anywhere. Okay. So after they emerge as fully formed adults, they spend four to six weeks mating, building nests, collecting food, laying eggs, getting that next generation ready to go. And then in the early summer, the eggs hatch, but they stay in that tube. And um, the larva feed, and then they spin their cocoons and they just stay in there. And during the fall and winter, they're dormant. So they have kind of an interesting life cycle. <clears throat> there are over 150 different types of mason bees. They don't all live in exactly the same places, but they carry out the same jobs. Um, they, okay, I guess I talked about all of this. They plug their nesting chambers with mud and each little egg with its food supply is separated from every other egg and the males emerge before the females. So that's pictures of what they look like. They're not all the same. There's the most common one in our area is what's called the blue orchard mason bee. So that's like that top picture. When I was describing that metallic blue bee, that's, that's what the most no, common Could you say it again, please? The kind? Blue Orchard, orchard. Mason Bee. You can buy the cocoons. It's not recommended because you don't know what they're native to. And the climate that they grew up in and the type of sun, the amount of sunlight and everything may be different than it is here. So they adapt to the environment that they live in. And that's why if you can raise your own and they're around here, all you have to do is provide the environment for them with a some place to nest, some mud, you know, and some water, and they will fill your tubes. And it may not be a lot the first year. If you've never done this before, you may not have a whole 
uh, house full of mason bees. But um, keep your own, keep it local, or if you have a friend that lives 20 miles away and they've got a lot of mason bees, I mean, that's still considered local environment. The environment is the same. The climate, the hours of sunshine, all of that will be very similar. So you could trade bee cocoons with other people in the area if, if they have a lot. Do remember that pesticides can harm your bee bees, so avoid them. Um, you want to be careful about spraying fruit trees. You should never spray them when the flowers are open. If you're going to spray fruit trees, they should be sprayed before the flowers open or after the little fruit has actually formed, after all the petals have dropped so that you're not killing the bees by spraying fruit trees. And of course, sprays on lawns is another thing. If your bees are going to be pollinating clover or dandelions or whatever might be in your lawn, um, that's, that's going to kill them. And I got this magazine in the mail this last week. And this is for organic growers. So they have all kinds of pesticides in here that are supposed to be safer for insects. I don't know. I, I just looked through it, but I did get that. So it, there are, I know organic growers do have uh, pesticides and so on that are available to them. Okay, types of bee houses. Well, you've probably seen them available to buy. <clears throat> so this is the kind of thing you're going to see that's available for you to buy. And there's lots of tubes in here that they could fill, but there's no way to get them out of here. Other things, this is just a chunk of a tree branch with holes drilled in it, which you could use like you use this wrap some twine or something around it and hang it in a tree. Do the holes go all the way through? Nope. The bees want a back. What's the thing about this one? Same problem you have with this one. There's no way of getting bees out of here. You could drill the holes a little bit bigger, put a cardboard tube into that hole, and then you'll be able to pull it out. Oh, Why do you want to pull it out? <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> okay, then there's the homemade kind, the kind that we're going to make today. And I, I don't have mine full, but these are grass stems that I cut to length. And bees, another thing about this one, bees actually like it better if they're not all exactly the same length. They like it if there's a little bit of difference in the length of the tubes. So um, the problem with the ones that you can't clean out is they really are should only be used one year. And the reason is if you can't clean them out, you, they can be infiltrated with pests that actually kill the bees, eat the little insect, the, the larva right inside their cocoons. And so it might work for one year, but after that, you're going to have a lot of pests in there, and it can actually be a death trap for your bees instead of being a nice hotel yeah. for them. So if you don't build one of these like this, where do they go naturally? They find holes, but they won't necessarily use the same places every year. And, you know, like the hollow stems and that type of thing, if those are available, they'll go in there too. Okay, I have a handout here. If you don't think that you're going to build more bee, bee houses, what this is, is it just gives the pros and cons of each type of nesting tube. And and also the mason bee perspective. So if I was a bee looking for a house, what would I think of this particular type of thing? A swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> so pass those out, and if you if you don't want one, that's fine. Or if you want to look at it now and then leave it here, that's that's fine too. So today we're going to try making a mason bee house. 
And we're going to make it in an aluminum can. Uh, so first thing that you want to do, and I brought a nail and a hammer. So the first thing you want to do is in the bottom of the can, about an inch in from the edge, in there because from the inside and I know you're not going to have a screw today but you can take you can take your tubes out at home and then from the inside and I didn't bring a screwdriver but you're going to put a screw into that hole so that it's sticking out and then you'll be able to screw that into a piece of wood because with our South Dakota wind, you know, you don't want this just blowing up and rolling who knows where. So that, that's in order to, you can attach that to a post or whatever from the inside so it's sticking out so that you can screw that into something where you, where you want your bee house to be. Okay, then you're going to prepare the tubes. So, these are two inches wide, cut from a brown grocery bag. And then you wrap them diagonally around a pencil or what size knitting needle? An eight or a nine or a ten. Okay, ten works best. Ten works best if you're using a knitting needle. <laughs> and you wrap that diagonally, and I'm I do this better if I'm at home sitting at my table. Wrap them diagonally around a pencil before you and and keep it tight before you start doing this. Have your little piece of scotch tape ready because it's hard to hang on to this when you've got it wrapped around there tight and then take your scotch tape off. Okay, the other thing that you can do, and I'll pass both of these around. You can certainly tell which is which. Um, well, they're about the same length, but you can also take a three inch wide by the length of the can, little rectangle of brown paper, and you wrap it around again, have your scotch tape ready. So for the diagonal one, you just need a little piece of scotch tape just to hold the end. On this one, you need a piece of scotch tape that's going to be the length of this piece of paper. And again, as tightly as you can, you wrap this around your pencil and then tape it. So I've got one of each kind here. You can tell the one with the tape, the whole length of it is the one that, that was started out as a rectangle. Okay, squeeze one end shut. That's the end you're going to put into the can because the bees want that, they want an end. They don't just want this hollow tube. If you collected and are using these, measure them the length of the can and then use a pruning shears to clip them off. And at, when you get way up here by the seed head, it's pretty narrow, so I didn't use those really, really narrow ones. And these are out there along wetlands. You can find them anywhere. Okay, so today what we're going to be doing, and you know, you don't have to finish the whole can full here. You can do that at home too, once you know what you're doing. So, what you're going to do is you're going to take your can with its screw in it, screw it into a piece of wood, and that should be facing east or south where it's going to get sunlight in the ends of your uh, little house. And then you're going to stuff the tubes in it out there. 
Okay? And they need to be in there really tight. South Dakota win. Personal experience. All my tubes blew out. The wind just sucked them out of my can. Well, so you want to avoid that by packing them in there really, really tight. And if you need to, stick some little pieces of moss in there or something that is going to hold those tubes in there tightly. Have an area of mud available for your bees. So now you've got your empty tubes in your can, your house is ready to go, you're just waiting for the bees to find it. But you have to have that, you know, water and you have to have mud available for them to be able to put their little mud things in there. So do they need to stand out in the open protected or do they, can they be amongst bushes or trees? They can be amongst bushes or trees, but you need to, they need to have that sunlight on them. So you'd have to have, you know, make sure that they are going to be able to get sunlight. And it's, it wouldn't hurt to have like a little roof over them or something to protect them from the rain. Um, okay, you're going to protect the cocoons over the winter. That top picture there, um, I don't have books here, but I told my husband I would like a couple of pieces of lumber, and he said he didn't have any because they're all long pieces. He didn't have any short pieces. But you can put two pieces of lumber together, put a strap or twine or something around them, and even more pieces. You could have a whole house like that. And be, where, where my fingers come together, you take a drill and you drill down, then it's gonna look like that. When you're in the fall, you can just take those all apart and you can easily get all those little cocoons out of there. So you wanna remove the tubes from the bee house, open the tubes to check the cocoons, you can sort them by male and female because the males are bigger. <laughs> and um, you want to check for predator problems. So that second picture here shows where some something has gotten in there and killed some of the eaten some of those babies in their cocoons. Well, you want to discard those if you find those. And you can either put your tubes. This is just a mesh bag. You can either put your tubes in there or you can put the cocoons in there. Someone gave me a bottle of wine in this. <laughs> I reuse and recycle everything. Um, and then put out in a sunny place when the temperature reaches 50 degrees in the 50s in the spring. Now, I can picture, because at my house I feed birds, I can picture these being a great snack for the birds. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to be really careful about where you put them. And if you want to leave them in their tubes, you could do that. You could just set this out in the spring because naturally the males will come out first. And you shouldn't have too much trouble with predators the first year. So then for the next year, you're just going to put all new tubes in your can. And you don't have to mess around with opening the tubes up and taking the little cocoons out. So if you're gonna leave them in there for the winter. I put them inside like a cold building, a cold garage. Outside then. Don't leave them outside because you will get predators like birds. Birds with their little pointy beaks can pull those right out of there and have that snack. So it's not the cold that bothers them. No, it's not the cold that bothers them. But you wouldn't want to put them in a warm place because it might speed up when they want to come out of their nests. So you definitely want them in a cold place for the winter. So then when you replace it from year to year, you're doing that in the fall. The replacement? You, after they come out in the spring, you would take the tubes out of there and then you can make them anytime and, and refill them. But you'd want them back in there, you know, for the bees to 
to build new houses. Um, this, I was not able to get that to come up, but there's a really good YouTube and it's about an hour long, but it takes you through all the steps, you know, visually. And it, uh, if you went to Mason B. Karen Cocoon Cleaning from Oregon State University Master Gardeners, you just Googled that or put that in the YouTube search, you should be able to pull that up. Um, all of our PowerPoints are in the library, on the library website page. If you go to uh, the seed library, under the seed library, every presentation that's ever been given here is available. So if you forget what this is, or you didn't bring a piece of paper to write it down or whatever, uh, I don't know how long it takes them to get that on the website, but um, then you'll see what that is, and, and that's a really good, I mean, there's lots of good information there, and there are lots and lots of videos, <clears throat> and there are people who have fruit orchards and that type of thing, who have videos on there about how they set up a whole bunch of these houses for mason bees to come and pollinate their fruit, so not just one little can, but a whole bunch of, of different ones. Okay, any questions before we get started? You talked about filling in the log. Yeah. And then you said hanging that. Now that's going to be... Yeah, it's going to be swinging. That's okay? Mm -hmm, that's okay. <laughs> any other questions? How high up in the... Should they be off the ground? About four to five feet is what's recommended. So, about like that. Anything else? So, no, we did this, our first cocoons would be next spring. Yes. Hopefully, you would have some mason bees that like what you have done, and they would, you know, use your house, and then next spring, the new bees would emerge. Do they okay. nest near the mud? Well, they only travel 300 feet, yeah. you know. So, yeah, you want the mud convenient, you want the fruit trees convenient, so, yeah. Anything else? Would they, would they come back from the same area? The same area? They, they would, but it's going to be, uh, this year's bees are going to be dead by fall, and so it's going to be the ones that are hatching out of here that are going to be here for next year. But you know, again, they don't fly very far. Yeah. So they're going to stay close to the area that they hatched in. The question about the mud. Okay, I just have a self-contained yard, so I don't have a mud hole in my yard. Can I put it in a container like I have an old kitty litter box? Can you put I think you could do that. Just make sure that you keep it wet. Right. And another thing I forgot, you need to change the water in your in your bee bath every day so the water's always fresh. Okay. I don't know how we're going to do this. We don't have a lot of table space. But the first thing you all want to do is punch a hole in the bottom of your can. So here's the nail and the hammer up here on the front table. And then you can pull chairs around. You can use this table if you want to. I can shove things together here so that you can start making your tubes. If you didn't bring any materials, you can certainly just do all this at home. Because we did not bring materials, except there are paper bags back there by the seed uh, library. So I can actually name it. You could. Yeah, it's it, it. uh, <laughs> 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 this how deep is it in here? About I, 
It goes almost to the bottom. So I'd say four inches. It does not have to be hollow. These can chew their way in there. Yes. Yeah. And 